Hello, everyone. My name is Sasha Sicard. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Member Engagement here at 8AA. I want to welcome you all to today's public webinar all about body focused repetitive behaviors. We are so excited to have Dr. Marla Diebler here with us today, who is a wonderful speaker and expert. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce ADAA. We have amazing resources to help you on your mental health journey. I invite you to explore our website and all that it offers, including a Find a Therapist database and a free online peer-to-peer -peer support group. Our speaker today is Dr. Marla Diebler, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and founder and executive director of the Center for Emotional Health of Greater Philadelphia. Um, she is specializing in the evaluation and evidence-based treatments of anxiety disorders, BFRBs, OCD, and related disorders. She is here to speak to us today about what BFRBs are, answer your questions at the end of the session, um, and really get right into um, how to best go about taking care of your mental health. Um, Dr. Diebler, let's just get this ball rolling. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you to ADAA. It's exciting to be here to share this lunch hour information dash on, uh, on BFRBs. So body-focused repetitive behaviors, or BFRBs, are a group of behaviors that include any kind of repetitive self-grooming behaviors that include uh, behaviors that involve pulling the hair, picking the skin, scraping the hair, skin, or nails, and they result in body damage. They're a heterogeneous group in that there's a wide range of behaviors and there's a wide range of functions that those behaviors serve as they're carried out. So we're going to talk about them kind of as an overview as a whole, but there are uh, a very wide range of individual differences from person to person. So body-focused behaviors specifically include, uh, predominantly, as you'll uh, be familiar with probably, trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, excoriation disorder, also known as skin picking disorder, or dermatillomania. But there are other kinds of uh, body-focused repetitive behaviors. We classify all of the body-focused repetitive behaviors in the obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders category of our diagnostic manual. The other body-focused repetitive behaviors also wide, very um, widely, and they can include things like nail picking or nail biting, which is the most common, of course. I'm sure we all have seen folks who bite their nails cutting of one's hair, biting of the inner cheeks, eating of the hair, um, eating of the skin, biting of the lips, tongue chewing, all sorts of different kinds of behaviors. Humans are very interesting and we all engage in grooming. So BFRBs are a common group of behaviors and a common group of disorders. Trichotillomania affects about one to 2% of the population. Skin picking affects up to 5.7% of the population. And the other body-focused repetitive behaviors are also quite prevalent. Our best estimates um, estimate that about 20 to 30% of the population engage in nail biting, about 3% of adults engage in cheek biting. And if you include other kinds of um, biting that is associated with um, dental health, such as biting the lips or the mouth or the cheeks, it may be up to 5.7% according to the dental literature. So really, BFRBs are quite common. So who develops a BFRB? Well, anyone can develop a BFRB. BFRBs occur across cultures and ethnic groups. They don't discriminate. Uh, the only difference, um, at least in the United States, among ethnic minorities is that ethnic minorities um, utilize treatment less uh, often. And so that's something we need to work on in terms of providing uh, greater access to care and making sure that we're reaching everyone that uh, needs our assistance. Recent studies suggest that there are no gender differences in prevalence, although historically it was our uh, thought that um, BFRBs, specifically um, trichotillomania and skin picking, occur more frequently in women. But we now ha have a greater understanding that this might not actually be the case, and it's most likely um, 
equally distributed across males and females. The onset is typically somewhere in early to mid adolescence, occurring slightly earlier with trichotillomania as opposed to skin picking, although it can occur at any time. I've seen um, older adults engaging in hair pulling for the first time or um, very young children, early childhood uh, toddlers or infants engaging in hair pulling behavior. We call this baby trick. Sometimes that behavior is transient, um, but it, it is a phenomenon nonetheless. So we can see it at any age. So how do BFRBs impact individuals? Um, there are great consequences, unfortunately, to these behaviors, potentially. There are physical effects of the behavior, such as the hair loss that's associated with a lot of hair pulling. There's skin damage and scarring, lesions, infections that sometimes occur um, because of pulling and uh, picking. Repetitive motion industries, injuries from the repetitive motion of the behavior. Dental enamel erosion from behaviors such as uh, nail biting. Gastrointestinal distress from ingesting the hair or the development even of a trichobezoar, which is essentially a hairball in the gastrointestinal tract that could potentially cause a blockage of um, of digestion. And so that um, is potentially a medical emergency and needs to be addressed surgically. It's not common, but it is something we need to look out for if someone does ingest hair. There are also emotional impacts of the behaviors. Um, for example, most individuals experience some level of embarrassment or shame associated with the behavior. Sadness, frustration um, for the difficulty they find in trying to stop the behavior. Low self-esteem or feelings of unattractiveness or feeling uh, fear of being discovered um, in terms of um, people noticing the behavior and fearing the consequences of what might people say or think. And there's a higher incidence of anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and other kinds of obsessive compulsive related disorders in the population of body focused repetitive behaviors. There are also functional consequences to the behaviors. For example, interpersonal avoidance or social isolation as a consequence. Um, as a result of the anxiety, as a result of the secrecy um, and uh, fear of being found out of the effort that it takes to, uh, and the time that it takes to engage in the behavior as well as to uh, avoid the consequences of the behavior and all of the um, covering up efforts uh, or camouflaging efforts that people sometimes engage in um, to try to, um, cover the, the impact of the behavior in terms of what is visible. Decreased time with others because of the time that, that pulling takes or picking takes up in one's life and also the efforts to camouflage. So um, avoidance of individuals by choice as well as by uh, unintentional uh, consequence is a potential impact of the behavior. Avoidance of medical care um, for, again, fear of being questioned about um, hair loss or skin lesions. Avoidance of salons for the same reason, um, haircuts um, and other kinds of grooming um, activities of that sort. Avoidance of leisure activities like being out in the wind um, for fear that um, hair will be blown out of place or makeup will be um, uh, disrupted being out in bright light, um, being in the water, like being at the beach or being in a pool, for example, um, sharing a room or a residence with others on vacation um, because of, again, um, what people might think if they learn of the behavior. There's an impact on education and employment at times in terms of um, attendance and in terms of being able to fulfill responsibilities. Again, the time and effort um, that an attention that these disorders take away from an individual um, is uh, sometimes pretty great. And there are financial costs associated with products and procedures and prosthetics um, as individuals attempt to camouflage or address the consequences of the physical manifestations of the behavior. So the functional consequences can be quite great as well. 
So why do people engage in body focused repetitive behaviors? This is something that is really in its infancy in terms of uh, the research. But we do know that there is likely to be a genetic underpinning and that this is a heritable condition. We know this from twin studies. We know this from studying um, genetics in animal models. And so we do believe that there's a genetic underpinning for developing a body focused repetitive behaviors. Also neurochemicals and hormones are thought to be involved, although it's unclear as to um, which um, neurochemicals or hormones they might be, but it is something that we need to consider. And there are a number of different kinds of conceptual models in terms of how we try to conceptualize and understand how these behaviors manifest and how they're played out. Um, we have an addictions model to consider. There is an animal model because uh, these behaviors do occur across a number of different species. So we look at this potentially as a disorder of over grooming. And then there's the learning model or behavioral reinforcement model, which is really the model that we use to help conceptualize an individual's struggles so that we're able to develop um, helpful treatment for them. So this is how we conceptualize BFRBs from a behavioral standpoint. We, could, we begin with vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities are different kinds of factors that sort of set the stage for whether or not one will develop a BFRB or experience BFRB symptoms. And those are things like those genetic factors, hormonal factors, um, how much sleep an individual gets, what their nutrition is like, uh, whether or not they've exercised for the day. But these kinds of vulnerabilities kind of set the stage for a BFRB. Then we have antecedents, and antecedents can either be internal or external. Antecedents are essentially cues to the behavior. They are triggers that make the behavior more likely to be carried out. Those internal antecedents can be things like thoughts, images, emotions, memories, sensations, urges, those internal private experiences that we all have. And then we have external antecedents. So external antecedents include uh, factors like um, how our body moves, what kind of activities we're engaged in, whether or not the behavior is carried out automatically without our awareness or whether it's goal-directed and we are aware of the rising sense of tension, for example, that occurs prior to the behavior that drives the behavior. And then other kinds of factors like people around us, where we are, the places and spaces, uh, what's in our environment, who's in our environment, and where we are. So all of those antecedent cues play into whether the behavior will be carried out. The behavior is carried out as um, a sequence of events uh, that includes the search for a target of skin, of hair, of um, nails, the behavior itself, how that's carried out, and the disposition of the hair, skin, or nails, the, the part that is removed from the body. And we need to pay attention to that. And so it's uh, different for everybody. And usually the behavior is carried out as a way to self-regulate. There's something uncomfortable, whether it's that thought, image, memory, emotion, sensation, urge, um, or um, some other kind of trigger like those external triggers that um, influence the behavior. And uh, the behavior is carried out as a way to self-regulate um, and to bring one back to comfort. Then there are consequences, unfortunately, to the behavior. So the behavior is carried out and the initial short-term consequences are typically positive. The behavior is, um, can be positively reinforced by serving the function of, for example, providing a pleasurable feeling. Or the behavior can be negatively reinforced by relieving some sort of unpleasant urge or unwanted internal experience of some sort, like a thought, um, disservice distraction, for example, from something that's bothering one. And then unfortunately, there are also long-term consequences. So those positive short-term consequences turn into negative long-term consequences. And those consequences are the ones that we talked about, those physical, emotional, and other impacts on one's daily life. And those negative consequences, unfortunately, also can perpetuate that cycle of the BFRB if the BFRB has been um, used to serve the function of initially helping you to feel better or otherwise manage those unpleasant antecedents as they arise. 
So in terms of treatment, we have a number of different kinds of treatments that are evidence-based. There is no FDA regulated uh, approved medication for body-focused repetitive behaviors at this time. Uh, what we have are evidence-based behavioral therapies um, that we know to be most effective at the moment. So they include, um, and I won't get into it because I know we have limited amount of time today, but those behavioral therapies um, that have uh, empirical support are procedures such as habit reversal training, the comprehensive behavioral treatment, that's COM, acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, either separately uh, as a sole uh, method of treating BFRBs or as an adjunct to HRT, and dialectical behavior therapy as an adjunct to HRT, specifically three out of four of the modules, including emotion regulation, distress tolerance, and mindfulness skills. So it's really um, DBT skills training in addition to HRT that's been studied and found to be helpful for BFRB treatment. Now, that being said, uh, we have some really great behavioral strategies, behavioral therapies used to um, treat BFRBs, but the field is still growing and learning uh, as we go. So we're continuing to develop customized, scientifically informed behavioral therapies that are all based on functional analysis, such as this functional analysis being that reinforcement cycle slide that I showed you. And those behavioral therapies that we're continuing to work on will uh, hopefully be aimed to continue to tailor our treatments, our uh, specific behavioral interventions that we use to each individual's established behavior pattern and needs. Again, this is a really heterogeneous group. And so we need to tailor treatment to each person's specific behavior patterns in order to give them a good set of skills to effectively manage the behavior. So we have some resources for folks. This is my contact information. I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions offline. Feel free to, to call or email me. Email is the fastest way to get to me. Uh, also have some information on my website. For additional information, training, consultation, other kinds of resources, the International OCD Foundation, the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, and of course, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America are great resources for information and for treatment providers in your area. All right, I'm happy to take questions. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just make us a little bigger so that they can see who we are talking to. Um, we did have quite a few questions come in. Um, so I'll start with one that's a little bit broader. What distinguishes a bad habit to a BFRB? Hmm. So we look at BFRBs in terms of a continuum, right? Everyone grooms, right? We all pick our skin. We've all picked a scab or a pimple or something like that. These are normative behaviors, right? We're built to do this mm -hmm. in order to take care of ourselves. But we can think of um, grooming behaviors as occurring on a continuum. So whereas some of us uh, engage in a little bit of grooming behavior, others spend a lot of time and it causes damage to our bodies uh, unintentionally and we have a difficult time uh, stopping the behavior when it does go awry and it impacts negatively our ability to function and causes distress. So in terms of what makes it disordered, um, it's really about how intense it is, how frequent it is, and how impairing it is, um, as well as whether or not it can, of course, be better explained by a medical condition or different kinds of psychiatric conditions, of course. Um, we need to consider the comorbidities as well or the better explanations. Um, in terms of the word habit, I just want to mention that, um, you know, I think we've gotten into the habit of uh, calling BFRB's habit over the years. And um, unfortunately, I think it has this kind of connotation of um, kind of not being a big deal, you know, because we all have habits, right? Uh, we have good habits and we have some not so good habits. And um, I think it implies that it's much easier to, to change than it really is. BFRBs are really, uh, really impactful on people's lives and they're really challenging to overcome even with the best of skills. So um, I would say it's, if it negatively impacts your life, um, it, it may be a, a BFRB rather than uh, just a habit that can be more easily changed. Yeah, 
Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We do use certain terminology kind of across um, the social conversation on different things. Um, even when we're saying like, that's so OCD of me, like, you know, that ends up having a different meaning. Um, someone has a friend who's suffering with BFRB who was sharing that on social media, and they wanted to know the best way to support someone who's struggling um, and how to provide that kind of emotional support system. That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking, and I'm so glad you want to be there for your friend. Um, the first thing that you can do is to be educated, right? To Showing up today is the first step. That's wonderful that you logged in on such a hot, sunny day, um, at least where I am. Um, so first is really to get educated. Um, there are lots of different kinds of resources out there on those websites, um, books available, books forthcoming, um, and um, first would be to be educated. Second is really to um, exercise acceptance. You know, we all engage in behaviors, some of which we like, some of which we don't like so much and we'd like to change. And this is just one of those behaviors. So um, accepting your friend for um, what they do and all they are as a whole. Uh, this is not who they are. This is just something that they do. Um, you know, creating a BFRB neutral anxiety uh, environment, um, you know, not paying too much attention to it, um, just like you would any other kind of behavior that they're engaging in, for example. Um, so, yeah. Also, you can ask them, how can I best support you? What can I do for you? Or maybe it's nothing at all. Maybe it's to pay no attention at all to it. Yeah, so we that is super helpful advice. Um, we have quite a few questions um, about kind of how to best self-treat and what's the best first step for someone who is suffering. So there are some great treatment resources available. In terms of self-help, there are some wonderful um, books available. There's a book for kids. Um, there is a, um, a nice book um, about treatment by uh, Charles Mansueto and his colleagues at the Behavior Therapy Center. Um, and in 2023, there will be a, uh, an, a patient uh, workbook, essentially, a self-help kind of workbook by my colleague and I. Um, to, to help individuals who don't have access to resources and would like to guide themselves through the development of skills to um, effectively um, help with their BFRB. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, and then we do have quite a few questions about BFRB's co-occurrence with other disorders, whether that be ADHD, um, someone mentioned uh, autism and how that might interact. Yeah, um, BFRBs do occur more frequently with other disorders in adults than they do um, independently uh, alone as, a, as an individual problem that someone is struggling with, specifically, as I mentioned, the other kinds of anxiety disorders or obsessive compulsive and related disorders, including OCD. Um, ADHD is uh, something that is also more highly comorbid. Um, so do they interact? Yes, certainly they can interact. And it's different for everyone, right? Poorly managed anxiety could potentially serve as one of those cues for the BFRB behavior. Poorly managed depressive symptoms could also, whether it's the mood itself or whether it's the, the isolation that sometimes happens as a result of struggling with depressed mood. Um, ADHD, um, being inattentive um, can, can pose a challenge for utilizing strategies for um, keeping a log of your behavior so that you can more effectively understand the pattern and um, come up with skills and strategies to intervene. And so, yeah, these things can interact with one another, which is one of the reasons that when we look at treatment, we really want to do a comprehensive uh, understanding, comprehensive clinical interview to make sure that we're kind of addressing all the different facets that may be involved in an individual's BFRB, because it really is so very different for everyone. Dr. Dubler, I'm going to give you a moment to self-promote. We do have some people who want to know um, how to know when your book workbook is going to be available and where they can find that information. Oh, I'm so excited about it. My colleague, uh, Dr. Renee Renardi and I will be uh, publishing a workbook, uh, should be out in 2023. Um, 
I'll hopefully be in touch with ADAA about it as well as other organizations and uh, it'll be on our website and uh, we'll do the best we can to, to kind of get the word out because I do think it'll be a useful resource um, for folks. There isn't anything like that out there as of now. No, just ADAA does have a web page with um, all of our members' publications that include a lot of self-help material. So be sure to visit our website. Um, and as soon as that is available, we'll make sure to have it listed on our website as well. We're happy to do that. Um, okay, turning back to questions. Have you seen instances of service animals that have been used to help with BFRBs? I haven't, although I certainly have seen people who find animals soothing. So, um, you know, petting their animal when they are feeling particularly distressed or particularly um, keyed up or uh, prone to their BFRB. I, I've seen people find that useful. I've also seen people find having an animal in their lap uh, not useful at all because sometimes individuals pull the hair of animals. Um, so uh, I think it's different for each person, um, but, but sometimes pets can be quite useful. That makes sense. Um, and for those who are wondering, this is being recorded and will be available for everyone to watch afterwards, um, both on our YouTube channel and on ADA.org. Um, okay, so we still have them all coming in, so I keep going through it. Um, we have a question on how one can follow the ongoing research on BFRBs. Uh, we have someone hoping to direct their master's thesis towards this uh, topic and are struggling to find people who are actively doing work in this field. Can you share some resources? Sure, um, I'm happy to provide uh, you with um, individual contacts. If you'd like, feel free to email me. Um, the best way to keep in touch uh, in terms of what's going on in the research is to check out bfrb.org um, as well as um, other organizations that are connected to the scientific community. Perfect, thank you. I hope they reach out. Um, and then we have um, some clinicians who are have joined us live today. Hello, welcome. Um, and they wanna know how you speak to your clients about BFRBs and what is a good place to start working with a new client who would like to reduce these behaviors? Uh, I, I begin by normalizing the behavior, right? Just like I did in talking uh, to you all today. Um, grooming behaviors are normal. And sometimes those behaviors go awry and uh, individuals need some help um, with this development of skills to help reduce those behaviors if they find that those behaviors are interfering with their lives and taking them away from that which is meaningful to them in their lives. Um, and so I kind of begin there and I provide some psychoeducation around it. And then we begin treatment based on, on that um, behavior therapy. Perfect. Um, and kind of following up on that, that someone wants to know what is the best form of treatment that you might recommend in your opinion on um, hair pulling? Behavior therapy. Um, uh, the comb model is a really great model, a uh, comprehensive behavioral model. There are a lot of people trained in um, using the comprehensive behavioral model. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is, is also very useful. Um, and uh, HRT is, has been a long used uh, and studied uh, behavioral therapy. We have a lot of different kinds of tools at this point, as long as you see someone who has some behavioral therapy skills, um, you're on the right track. So for those who are struggling, let's like wrap it up. Um, is it likely that they're able to get better um, using these kind of treatment methods? Yeah, the, the really wonderful thing about BFRB treatment is that people can develop the skills in order to effectively minimize the impact that having a BFRB has on their lives. BFRBs are typically chronic. They, they tend to wax and wane throughout people's lives, just like other kinds of disorders like um, obsessive compulsive disorder. You're not, not gonna be rid of um, uh, obsessions entirely forever, but we can change the way that we respond to our experience of them and really minimize the way that they impact our lives so that we have a high quality of life and we're able to uh, pay attention to 
all the things and, and the people that are meaningful to us uh, as we go through our journey. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing all your information. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for all their wonderful questions. Um, like I said, this will be available. And if you have any questions, you can either email ADAA and we'll send them over to Dr. Diebler or you can go and uh, reach out to her as well. Um, but I'd like to just end off today with a, a great big thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining today. And everyone enjoy your nice hot summer. Bye-bye. <laughs>